One of the things that is characteristic of the Lord's church, and for that matter, any successful secular organization of this world, and there are several things necessary to have things work as people would like for them to work, is the matter of cooperation. And since the Lord's church is the institution of the saved, to which the Lord adds all those who are baptized for the remission of sins, then of course there ought to be, as the New Testament teaches, cooperation between the members with one another. Sometimes we forget about that. I know that you look around about you and about everything involved in business in some way or the other, other is uh, decent in order. That's necessary for proper cooperation. And when it comes to schools, there's decently in order. That involves an organization and it involves cooperation. It involves matters of authority and uh, channels of authority and positions of authority. So when you look to the body of Christ, the Lord's church, you would expect to find the same thing. Of course, Christ is the only head of the church. He is the sovereign king over the kingdom, the head of the one body. He's the savior of that body. And he it is who sets out his will in the words of the New Testament in particular and in general, just the whole Bible. So one of the things we would need to learn as we become a Christian and as we're going to be faithful in the church is that Christians, brothers and sisters in God's family, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, must learn to work together. It's just an absolute necessity. And if you're somebody that just doesn't want to have a thing in the world to do with anybody else, or as we talked about this morning, if you're somebody that's self-willed or it always must be done your way, then there's going to be problems. Uh, sometimes study your Bible. Study what Jesus taught, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Study the whole thing just from one perspective. And that is the members getting along with one another. Each to esteem other better than themselves. Well, if we get to that point, we'd, <laughs> we'd accomplish a lot. But uh, I think a lot of people just aren't going to sit down and say, well, brother so-and-so over here is better than me. That is the humble attitude, the attitude that says we care for each other in our different degrees of knowledge of the Bible, in our experience in serving Christ, and all of those particular things. But it's all a reality. It's a fact that such is the case, just as it is in the public school system or in any small business or large business. Their experience makes a difference. The military, is it all look that way? It's in a sense, it's a common sense thing that says if an institution, whatever it's doing, is to function as is meant to function, there just simply must be cooperation, and there can't be cooperation if there's not a different assigned task according to the several abilities of all of those who are involved in whatever that organization may be. Paul said to the church in Corinth in his second letter, chapter 6 and verse 1, and working together with him. Let's just stop there and not read the rest of the verse. I like the idea that God is saying to us as members of his family, his children, members of the citizen or citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we're working with him. Yet who would think among the members of the church that we're to do what he does. His job is totally different, if you want to look at it from a human perspective, from ours. Even within the Godhead 3, God's role, the first person of the Godhead, wasn't the Son's role. It wasn't the first person of the Godhead who was to come to the earth and become a man. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's obligation to take on flesh and become a man. It was the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word, who tabernacled in the flesh, became a human so he could be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14. 
So even in the Godhead 3, you see cooperation, eternal cooperation. So how much more so will it be if we see that the church is to carry out the Father's will as presented through the Son in the New Testament, that there must be cooperation with us. We work together with God when we submit to God. When we, as the song says, let him have his way with us. There is no other way, and this is where this ties into this morning's sermon, that we can do that except we submit to his will. Submission is not always an easy thing. You see that in Jesus in the garden. Now Jesus knew that there had to be his sacrifice if there's going to be any salvation from sin for man. Had to be no other way around it. The prophets all knew that. Think of the Messianic prophet Isaiah in writing the suffering servant, Isaiah chapter 53. It was a fact that he was going to do that. The prophet said that he would. And yet when you see Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he's laboring to bring his human self into subjection to the will of the Father. And he's praying, is there any other way, Father? If there is any other way to save mankind, please let this cup pass from me. But now notice the resignation of the Christ. The, this is the example for each one of us. This is necessary. This cannot be dispensed with. And more than that with Christ, he could literally think this way. It's not going to get done if I don't do it because there's not anybody else to do it. Think about that for a minute. So he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So you see the, the human Christ, as human as you are and I am, not wanting to go to the cross. Who would want to do that? I don't think Stephen wanted to get stoned. I do not think that uh, any of those men, such as James, brother of John, when Herod cut his head off with the sword, don't you know he was just thrilled to have that done? No. All things that pertain to service to God... And all of the love we have within us that says we will obey God doesn't always mean it is a thrill to do it. And yet at the same time, we're taught, and Jesus taught us, that we should count it an honor to suffer for the Lord. But that doesn't take away the pain. That doesn't take away the loneliness because it was Christ and Christ alone of the Godhead three who became a man and had to tread the wine press alone. Father didn't do it. The Holy Spirit didn't do it. The angels didn't do it. He had to do it. He had to become man. He had to undergo temptation like we undergo temptation. And yet he would not yield. So when you think of working together with him, then when you become a Christian, he has saved you from your sins by your humble obedience to the gospel then he knows something about submitting to the Father's will. He knows something about cooperating with the Father and with the Holy Spirit to do what he alone could do with the Godhead three. Now you say, well, I'd like to know more about that. Well, so would I, as there would be a whole lot more things I'd like to know about. However, we only can know what's revealed in the words of the Bible. And I know that the second person of the Godhead has always been the executor of the Father's will. That's why he has had delivered into him all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. So when we who have been added to the church by guess who? Jesus Christ. When we were buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins. Then we are working together with him. And so Paul says, we entreat also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. That is, it's pointless to you. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. So not only must we work in the sense of obedience to the Father's will, cheerfully and full of thanksgiving that he has made it possible for us to have that free gift through humble obedience to his will. That's the way we receive it. But we are able to work together as brothers and sisters, all who have experienced the same. Every member of the church heard the same gospel, had the same loving disposition toward God and the Christ, 
and his word and all from the heart obeyed the same gospel and were made free from our past sins and the Lord added us to the church. Well, you know, that's a great incentive if you'll think about that just to work together with your brothers and sisters in Christ under the headship of Christ, that is, under his authority. Paul teaches cooperative work by using the figure of the human body. Listen to him as we read again from Paul's pen in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 27. For the body is not one member. That might come as a surprise to some brethren. That I'm not the only member of the church. The one single solitary body of Christ to which our Lord adds all who have from the heart obeyed the gospel is composed of many different people. So for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is not therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it not therefore not of the body? If the whole body were, notice how sometimes things get rather ridiculous. If the whole body were an eye, can you just see one eye floating around? Where were the hearing? How would that eye that can see hear anything? If the whole were hearing, then where were the smelling? And then he goes on to say later, Now ye are the body of Christ. And the American Standard renders it, And severally members thereof. So the Lord knew all along that as each person heard and lovingly understood the truth and in great faith obeyed it and the Lord himself added them to this body that there would be all these people with different degrees of knowledge and faith but they all had the faith sufficient to save them and that they obeyed the gospel and the Lord added them to the church now they've been born of water and the spirit now they can begin to grow and to develop as individual Christians working together with God in that spiritual body which is the church and we should labor to do that. Now, you know already what that means. It means that I can't always have my way, and you can't always have your way. It just doesn't work that way. And besides that, if you have that disposition of heart, now there's where the problem is. You've got to back up. But you say, is it, you, mean, you mean that only applies to the body of Christ? No, it applies to the home. There's organization in the home. Did God make the youngest child in the home the head of the house did God make the oldest child in the home the head of the house did God make the wife and mother the head of the house and what does being the head of anything mean there's responsibility there to lead and to guide and direct in the case of the home the husband does that by loving the wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it he considers her as the weaker vessel. He considers the order of things as God established this first God-ordained institution. There's no dictatorial whatevers. And so the wife brings herself into subjection to the truth of God regarding the headship of her husband. She doesn't try to usurp it. And the husband loves her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And loves her as his own flesh. And she recognizes his position and he recognizes hers. And they both know this is a God-assigned position. And the Bible directs how those things work. And they both see what parents are, as the New Testament teaches. And they see their authority over the children. And as children grow up and get older, then they're educated, trained, and they're taught in understanding those things. Because guess what they're going to do in... Uh, few short years they're going to start the whole process all over again so I don't know of a better place to teach the responsibility of a female and a male and then a husband and a wife and then parents than in the home itself except that in teaching the Bible which the church is authorized to do the home is backed up by teaching the truth of the gospel that bears on those things but none of that can be worth anything if the spirit of cooperation, number one, submitting to God and letting him have his way with thee in all of those areas. Just look at, back to the church now, the Lord's church. Why is it organized the way that it is? Let's just suppose we're all Christians. 
Now, I'm going to deviate from the divine pattern I talked about this morning. And I'm going to say this is the only church of our Lord on the face of the earth. There was a time when the church in Jerusalem was the only church of the Lord on the face of the earth. And the Lord in his great wisdom in the infant stage of the church had the apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, and by the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, then God through them gave them the apostles' doctrine. And the church knew that because verse 42 says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine because they knew that's the way the Lord's making his will known. And to be pleasing to him, we follow the apostles' teaching. And by the way, it still works today because they've got it in writing now. It was in men then. But now let's say we're the only church here. How do we organize this church? Well, we say, well, go to the Bible. No, no, we don't have that for our sake of illustration. So how are we going to organize this church? Well, let's take a vote on it. So are we going to have president? Are we going to have legislative bodies? Are they going to be elected for a certain period of time? Or are we going to just simply have one person making all of the decisions? And whoever runs for that office, maybe four or five. Or if you like some parties, maybe the whole church runs. But whoever gets the majority vote, that fella, for a period of, say, four years, is the person that says, this is what goes in this church. Well, why not if we're going to do it as men think it ought to be? But, of course, if we're submitting to the authorized will of heaven and the inspired word of God, then we know who's the head of the one worldwide body of Christ. What's left up to us? It's, it's the person who built this church. And it meant so much to him, he shed his blood, gave his life to purchase it. And throughout the Bible, specifically the New Testament, of who? Of Christ. His will is manifested. We are the spiritual body of Christ. So the head of, who is Christ directs us. Your head directs you. So Christ is the head of this. And he directs us through his last will and testament of the Bible. It's how I know about elders. It's how I know about deacons. It's how I know about teachers and what preachers of the gospel are. Did any man come up with that independent of God? No. It's all according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And we'll give an account someday to God for that as well as everything else. John 12, 48, as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. But cooperation is involved in every bit of it. You cannot remove cooperation from the church under the authority of Christ in the New Testament and have an institution worth anything. And I don't think a lot of members, or at least some members, have realized that. I used to teach in preacher training school when I was involved in that. And you've heard me say this before, but it's worth saying many times. You may be prepared to answer every liberal doctrine there is, and you may be prepared to answer every denominational doctrine there is, or any anti-doctrine there is, or all sorts of other doctrines, atheists included. And then the first work you go to, you may find out none of those things bother the brethren. They just hate one another, and they're not about to cooperate with one another. And if you preach very long, you'll get there or find some that are like that. They just got that self-willed spirit. They don't work in a group. They don't know there is a group. They know that they're there, and really... Isn't that all that matters? Well, that's so foreign to the spirit of Christianity is set out in the truths of the New Testament. Each member of the body of Christ is to supply his own part from whom all the body fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplieth according to the working and due measure of each several part maketh the increase of the body into the building up of itself in love. Ephesians 4, 16. Well, that's the way it works. You can't get any better than that. There's God telling us through the Spirit, the will of Christ, concerning our working together, our cooperative efforts as brothers and sisters in the family of God. How many of you have ever, in some surgical procedure, had a nerve block? 
I won't ask for a show of hands, but you may have. Well, I've had two of them in this arm. And when that full nerve block sets in, I don't know how to describe how I viewed this arm. Uh, a big stick of baloney, really. Uh, it, I never knew how heavy something could be, how useless it felt. Well, it didn't feel. That was the problem. There was no feeling in it. It was just dead. <laughs> of course, they go to cutting on it. I'm glad it was. But nevertheless, that's, that's how it's hard to explain an appendage when it's just there. You can't control it. You can't move it. And then later on, feeling starts back into it, and you start feeling a little tingle maybe in the end of your fingers, and then gradually it all starts coming back until finally the old brain's able to work through the nerves and you've got control of it again. And it does what you want it to do. <laughs> but when it's, when it's, quote, dead because the nerve's been blocked, then it's sometimes like some of my brethren. They don't know that there's a whole body there. They're just separated completely from the body. Mind you, of an elephant's trunk swinging. <laughs> well, you can't see that in your Bible. Just take your Bible, read it, and believe what you read. The human body is used to illustrate then the church, the body of Christ. And the figure teaches both individual and cooperative activity. And it's for the good of all of us under the headship of Christ, under the will of Christ. The church is said to be fitly framed and knit together as its growth is according to the work, working in due measure of every several part. That's the way the human body is, isn't it? How many of you right now are thinking about your little toe on your left foot? Anybody? Show me your hands. How many of you are thinking about that? Now, you are probably since I said that, but when I ask it, how many? I doubt you are. But if somebody walked up there just before I said that and took a hammer and went whop right on that little toe, your whole body would scream. You wouldn't be giving any attention whatsoever to anything but that little toe. And you'd find out it's a very important part of your body, at least when it comes to feeling. As members of the church, how many little toes do we have in this room? Well, maybe you'd just like at least to be a big toe. <laughs> how many thumbs we got in this building? How many ears? How many eyes? And you can go on and on and on. So the Holy Spirit in His great wisdom in teaching us cooperation between brothers and sisters in Christ uses that simple thing as the human body. The functions of the various parts of the human body then serve to show us how we should be with one another. Solomon teaches the wisdom of cooperative work by what was very common in his day and still is to some of the parts of the Middle East. He says in Proverbs 20, or rather 30 in verse 27, The locusts have no king, yet they go forth by bands. In other words, it's organization. Now when they would have those millions upon millions upon millions of locusts that would descend upon as a plague and destroy all green vegetation, uh, they still did it according to the inspired word of God in the way locusts operate. They went in bands. There was order there. You know, one grasshopper doesn't do too much bad work on something. But if you've got them coming in that way, all of them doing what grasshoppers do and coming in bands, they'll destroy every green thing there is. Solomon again said, And, and if a man prevail against him that is alone, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken, Ecclesiastes 4.12. That doesn't take a Harvard-educated person to understand what our Lord's trying to get over to us. And you take a bundle of sticks, and it's not very easily broken, but you take one out at a time, and you can break them pretty easy. These things are, are simple, but they're really profound as to the church when you apply it to it. 
We're God's fellow workers, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Notice how he, he teaches that when he talks about some of the workers of that day. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. As a preacher of the gospel for over 55 years, I've seen a great many preachers, and it's a temptation to all preachers of the gospel because if you are what you are in desiring to see souls saved and knowing it's only by the proclamation of the truth and their belief and obedience to it that they can be, then it's awful easy to try to get over on the side of God giving the increase. But if you're either, as a teacher of the truth, a sower of the seed, or you're a waterer to one extent or the other. But I know from the Bible that word preach will not return void. But it may be like a pharaoh. His rejection of the truth he now knows may harden his heart. If it is, you don't want him in the church anyway. So the Word of God can do that. On the other hand, the Word of God may be sown in a heart that at present moment is disinterested. Yet things can happen in a person's life five years down the road that causes them to refocus. Remember the prodigal son? When you see him come back to him, or come to himself and come back to the father, he's operating on what he'd been taught years before. Well, why did he get in that mess in the first place? Because he neglected it. He rejected it. But yet when he came to himself, he remembered what he had been taught years before and what the circumstances were at his father's house. And upon the basis of past teaching, he turned and he came back. So we preachers or anybody that teaches the truth, you can't expect everybody all at once to do everything they ought to do. Should they? Ought they? Well, yes. As soon as you hear the truth and you recognize your state of affairs and the light of it, you ought to obey the gospel right then. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. A lot of times it doesn't happen that way. And so we who are sowers of the seed of the kingdom have to let the chips fall where they may or maybe better said the seed fall where it may. But God will give it in his own due course. So there's order even in conversion or who is converted and how they're converted and who is even not converted. Nehemiah was able to accomplish the huge task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem only through cooperation. When Nehemiah explained his purpose, the people replied, let us rise up and build. Now those people knew that wouldn't get done unless there was organization unless there was levels of authority, unless each one cooperated with the other. The task was so great that their enemies took delight in ridiculing them for even thinking that they could accomplish this erroneous undertaking. Just read Nehemiah, but specifically chapter 2 and verse 19 and chapter 4 verse 3. But through the cooperative efforts of the laborers, the walls were built. Why is that in your Old Testament? Since it was written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Well, it's to teach us that spiritual Israel, the walls of spiritual Israel, will work the same way. The enemies of God's people were very alarmed at their success, and so they wanted to attack them. And so what did the builders do? Well, they took their weapons with them, and they were ready not only to build, but to defend what they were building. That was their dedication and zeal for things as they ought to be. Nehemiah said, so we built the wall. Note that, we. There's some people that just don't know we's in the vocabulary. So we built the wall, for the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah 4, 6. Now note that Nehemiah said we. I can't emphasize that too much. There's a host of folks that always have been in the church that don't know it's a we. I know that because I've heard too many of them when something's not going like they want. Well, they, those people down there, they divorce themselves completely from their brothers and sisters because things aren't done like they want it. They don't know there's a cooperative matter. They don't know their blood relations, none whatsoever. So if one is a member, why shouldn't he refer to the church as we? what we are doing. There are several reasons as to why members fail to cooperate. There's simply a lack of the spirit of being one, of understanding New Testament teaching on the oneness of the church. Yet, we're taught that we're to walk by the same rule, Philippians 3, 6. 
God's children are to be of the same mind, Philippians 1 and verse 27. In fact, the Old Testament says in Psalm 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to fight like cats and dogs. Oh, I misread that, didn't I? To dwell together in unity. Although too many times it's otherwise, but to dwell together in unity. There can't be any cooperation unless there is the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. He that soweth discord among brethren does a hateful and abominable thing in the sight of God. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Notice, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Galatians 5, 15. Why is that in your Bible? When you read that, what are you seeing? What does it mean to me? Paul tells us that two contrasted dispositions keep Christians from cooperating. Self-depreciation. Uh, the foot underestimates its value because it's not the hand. The uh, ear minimizes its worth because it's not the eye. And that's the way he reasons in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 15 and 16. So because they can't be what somebody else is, or at least the way they think, they never are able to be active and cooperate with anybody else. Then there's the depreciation by some of their brethren. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Or again, the head of the feet, I have no need of thee. Although sometimes that can happen. Well, you know, if they just let me run the show, it'd be all right. But neither one of those attitudes is what the New Testament teaches should be if cooperation is to be around. We talked a little bit about the self-willed spirit this morning. The self-willed spirit is a, a spirit that, well, it just can't see anything but self. When the Bible teaches there ought to be a selfless spirit, a willing to do whatever needs to be done. You don't see a lot of people like that. A willing to do whatever needs to be done. And making yourself available. That I'll do whatever you want me to be. Whatever you judge that I'm able to do. I'm ready. Here am I. Send me. A lack of understanding between uh, the elders or in the church and its other members can prevent cooperation. Folks, just, I know you, we preach the truth on the organization of the church and the, the qualifications and the, the qualification to work of elders, qualification to work of deacons, qualification to work of preachers, teachers, and so on. But I learned a long time ago you can preach this till you're blue in the face, and then if you ask somebody about what the Bible teaches on any of those things, they give you a stare like a deer caught in headlights because they don't know. They don't understand the relationship. They don't know why God set it up that way. But remember, he did set it up that way. Nobody, no human, had anything to do with setting it up that way. There is no point in having leadership unless you have fellowship. And that just rubs some people till they're, they take a boatload of talcum powder to keep them chafing. That's just all there is to it. Put it bluntly. Spiritually, that's the way we are. The elders are to lead the flock, not the wealthiest people. And I know that, you know, just, why has he got to say that? This is how people feel. Shut up, don't say that again. Who's going to lead it? Well, Jesus head of the church, let him lead it. But it's Jesus who's the head of the church in his last will and testament that set men in as elders or pastors or presbyters or overseers. Men who set, met certain qualifications and men to do a certain work. If they're not going to be the leaders, who are? The women of the congregation? The wealthy of the congregation? The teenagers of the congregation? And every time the elders sit down to make a decision, have they got to call everybody and say, now we're thinking about doing this. What do you want us to do? You know better than that. And I know better than that. I worked too long. I could live another 20 years serving as an elder, and I still would not have served as long uh, that way as I have as a preacher, under elders. And when I say under, I don't mind saying I'm under the elders. And you know what? Even as an elder, I'm under the elders. If you ask me something that the elders haven't talked about, then I'm going to say, well, when I've talked to the elders, I'll, I'll find out. 
because it's a collective decision that the eldership makes that is binding on each one of the elders and on everybody else. The congregation should follow the leadership in the Lord's work. Now, if you say, well, I just don't intend to do that. Well, take it up to the Lord and have judgment. See how far you get with it. That's what the Bible teaches. That, well, I guess you're saying the elders are infallible. You've got the Holy Spirit like the Apostle Paul. No, and the Lord knew that when he set up elders. That's why there's a collection of elders. But if there's going to be cooperation, remember it begins with cooperating with God and cooperating with God is to know the will of God and submit to it. Now, you want a church without elders? Do you want a church without deacons? What do you want? And there's the problem. What do you want? But what do we say in the beginning? What does God want? Do you think Paul was infallible in every action he made? Or was he infallible when he was teaching the truth? Obviously the apostles were not that way because Paul had to withstand Peter to the face in his practice because he didn't practice the truth regarding the Gentile converts. And another apostle was stood in the face because he was to be blamed. So even where you had inspiration working, that didn't mean in their individual lives they were always what they ought to be. If that's not in the Bible to teach that, you tell me why it's there. And yet evidently Peter took the correction because later he did what a lot of brethren won't know concerning those who've corrected them. He wrote about our beloved brother Paul. And the truth of the matter is, some people just aren't going to take correction. When I was in my first uh, full-time local work 139 years ago, I like to embellish things when you get to that point. There was an elder there, and I used the word very loosely, who got so angry that he declared to some of the men who went to see him that he ought to just come down to that church and tear it all to pieces. Proving, of course, when he said that, that he never should have been an elder in the first place. That he was not qualified to be an elder. The only problem with that is, is that some members think they can take the same viewpoint and they're perfectly sanctified before God in doing that kind of thing to stir up a mess in the church. Cooperate and work with other Christians under the headship of Christ by the authorized will of heaven. It's the way it works. And even if you don't think it will work that way, it does work that way from God's perspective. So if we're going to be the Christians that are going to remain faithful, if heaven is to be our home, then that's the way it's going to be. And I want you to think of this when you leave. And from how much longer God gives you on this earth, and that may not even be till tonight. God's way is the best way. It always has been. It always will be. It may be painful. It may not feel good. And I can tell you from experience, it doesn't sometimes when you do what's right because it's right and not because it feels good. The Lord can tell you something about that. But it's the way that's right and can't be wrong and it'll get you to heaven. I baptized a man a long time ago and in the process because I've liked medicine somewhat. He was a veterinarian, and I'd help him do surgeries, and nobody else would get around it. And we had good Bible studies over all sorts of split open dogs and cats. And finally baptized him. I don't know where they are today. But he was a moaner and complainer, and he would moan and complain before he was baptized. And so I just said, well, let me see your hands one day. I just got kind of tired of that. I said, let's see if we can teach a lesson. I said, let me see your hands. Right in the middle of a surgery. There they are, gloved hands. I said, let me see where I need to see them. Put them under the light. And I looked at them. I said, wow, there's not a nail scar in there. What are you fussing about? Maybe we better tell ourselves that. For the reason the nails were put in Christ's hands. And he told us we would suffer if we're faithful just like he suffered before we start getting all beside ourselves and saying it must be done our way because it never will be anyway and you'll just cause all sorts of problems for yourself to begin with, for your family, and for everybody that's around you.
Brethren, uh, we've talked about being Christians today and the cooperative effort of the church to be successful. You won't satisfy a lot of folks, no matter if somebody else had preached this sermon. You just won't. Because people have to want to be satisfied, and if they don't want to be content, they're not going to be content. We joke about it sometimes. Say, well, your mama's not content, and ain't nobody content. Well, we joke about that, but that's true about a lot of things. If we don't want to be content, we won't be content. But why don't we want to be content based upon the authority of the Scriptures concerning cooperating with one another and getting the work of the church done? If you're not a Christian, now's the time to become one with the full realization that you'll be cooperating with God when you obey the gospel to become a Christian, that if you live faithful, you'll do that all through your life in the Lord's family of the church. If as a child of God you sin, you need to repent of those sins, come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness to comply with his second law of pardon for the erring child of God. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.